Good morning, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy weeks amidst the end of year and holiday schedule to learn a little bit more about our cybersecurity guide. Uh, this is Coalition's monthly webinar series where we talk about different cybersecurity topics. And today we're really excited to be presenting our 2021 cybersecurity guide. Now, for those of you who've been partners or customers for a while and have attended prior webinars, we've covered a lot of different topics throughout the past year on best practices for security. So you know, the recommendations that we make to all organizations to ensure that they stay secure. And we're excited to have combined all of these recommendations and best practices into a comprehensive cybersecurity guide that really provides kind of our best recommendations for how small businesses can stay secure uh, in 2021 and beyond. My name is Jen McPhillips. I'm excited to be moderating the conversation this morning and I'm joined by two of my colleagues. So first, Catherine Lyle. Catherine is the head of our claims team, and this is the team that's responsible for partnering with policyholders uh, after they've experienced a breach or some sort of event to navigate the recovery process. And she's been here uh, for over three years and has really sort of helped everything from you know, small recoveries, uh, you know, quick turnaround, all the way to recovering multiple millions of dollars on behalf of insurance. So very excited to have her here. I'm also joined by Leanne Niccolo, who's an incident response lead on our coalition incident response team. And if anyone has had the misfortune of having a claim, uh, Leanne is on the team and leads the team that is responsible for the forensics and remediation work. So, you know, for example, companies that experience a ransomware event, this is the team that's helping identify what was the cause of the incident, reconfiguring security settings to help um, organizations get up and running uh, and back to business. So just a quick note on Zoom before we get started on the content itself. I think we're all very familiar with Zoom at this point, but you should see two controls at the bottom of your screen, a chat function and a Q&A function. And we'd welcome you to submit questions throughout the presentation. I'll be taking questions uh, at every sort of topic that we go through. And we'll also reserve some time at the end for open Q&A. So just a quick note about who we are. We're excited to be joined by a broad group of policyholders and broker partners as well. Um, Coalition is the fastest growing provider of cyber insurance as well as security in the US and Canada. And one of the things that makes us different in the marketplace is the fact that you know, not only do we provide a comprehensive insurance program, but we also have a set of security tools and platform that helps our policyholders prevent claims from occurring in the first place and then recover more quickly when they do occur. We're gonna go through a few different topics today. So first we're gonna kind of set the stage with some context about coalition's claims experience and get, shed a little bit of light on the data that we have on claims that helps sort of inform some of the recommendations that we're making in terms of security protocols to put in place. Then we're gonna talk about the specific security recommendations that we recommend all businesses implement. We're gonna be sharing our top 10 recommendations. I'm going to talk about how you can access the full cybersecurity guide, and then we'll have some questions at the end. So with that, I'm excited to turn it over to my colleague, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. Afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come and listen to our webinar, both as clients, uh, insureds, and brokers. Uh, this is really quite important for us to be able to talk about what we're seeing and how that translates into recommendations for security uh, to basically better your company or to help your insureds, your clients better secure themselves. So the first thing we wanna look at is, you know, why we're making these recommendations. And when we look at kind of the global frequency, one of the, the easiest places to talk to you about why we're making these recommendations is to look at the global claim frequency. So the market trend right now is that 6.2% uh, of you know, insureds out there in the world are making cyber claims. That means that they're experiencing cyber events, they have cyber insurance and they're making those claims. But when you look at 
the coalition numbers, they're at 1.5%. So the question there, the natural question is why? Why is that occurring? And that why is very important. That why is also why we're here today. Because in addition to being an insurance company, Coalition is also a technical security company, right? So we are scanning, we're alerting. Um, and today we're going to recommend to you. And the recommendations are really more driven by what we're seeing of these 1.5% claims. So what we're actually seeing as we move forward through this deck is that we have phishing, remote access, and social engineering. And with those, we see 89%. So remember that 1.5% that we just talked to you about. 89% of those claims are from phishing, remote access, and social engineering. If you do a deeper dive on that, you see that 54% right here is email and phishing, and 29% is remote access. So quick math, 83% of that, right? This can be controlled by some simple security measures, not things that are you know, extremely expensive, not things that are not useful in the overall day. But these are controls and simple measures that can then reduce the likelihood that you as an insured, you as a company, you as a broker, your client will see a cyber event. So what those recommendations are you know, and why is, is important. And I, I wouldn't be an attorney if I didn't throw a few disclaimers at you, uh, right? Generally, these are recommendations. These aren't sure-fired, get out of jail free kind of things. These are things that it makes it harder for a threat actor to access your systems. And the moment you make it harder, they move on to the next company who hasn't. Right? So you want to be, you don't want to be the low-lying fruit. You want to be higher up on that tree. And that's what these do. All of these recommendations, they apply to all organizations. So if you're like, wait a minute, I'm in manufacturing and someone says, well, wait a minute, no, I'm in healthcare. It applies to all of you. And same for the brokers that are listening to all of your clients. Right? And in particular to small businesses, we've aimed at some of the things that we're seeing in that small and medium market. We, under do, we do this and we understand that every organization, the data and the security needs are different. And so we have a team that is here today to make these recommendations, but we also have a team that's available if you feel that you need more tailoring. And that's our CERT team. And you're able to discuss specific security programs, different types of implementation. And we do that through an invite, a Calendly invite, and you can control the dates and times. So to our broker friends as well, you can encourage any of your clients to meet with our, our team as well through that. Any of our insureds, you can click and schedule a time as you see fit. So from here, I'm going to launch in so that Leanne can really talk to you about these top 10 security recommendations and you'll see how it connects to what we're trying to prevent is that 89% of claims arising from phishing, remote access, and social engineering. So Leanne? Excellent, thank you, Catherine. Um, so just to further what Catherine kind of started out saying, uh, the majority of the attacks that we are seeing now are definitely uh, opportunistic rather than targeted. Um, so with that being said, a good analogy that I like to share with a lot of our clients that do get breached is everybody has a door to get into their house, right? So think of your house as your network. Um, if you have one door and it is unlocked, it is a easy opportunity for a criminal to walk into the house. If you have a door that is locked, it is less of an opportunity. If you have two doors that are locked, if you have three doors, not to say it's impossible, it's, I rarely use that word in the cyber realm because if a attacker, an attacker wants to target an attack, um, there are many ways to do so. Um, but with the majority of the attacks being opportunistic, the more doors that you have up, the more common that the attacker is just gonna go on to the next house and move away from your network. Um, so today is to provide you guys with the high level recommendations that we advise anybody on the internet to follow. Um, 
We understand that every organization has different needs, um, but today we're just going to give the best measures to take on prevention overall with really without knowing anything specific about your environment. So the first one is increased email security. Um, this is a big one. We are seeing, I would estimate about five to 10 business email compromises a week. Um, so that ranges usually in a common scenario, a malicious actor is spoofing an email and then trying to misdirect wire transfer. Um, we also see attackers utilizing mailboxes that have been compromised to further compromise mailbox. So to utilize a account that they took over to send additional emails um, out to recipients with malicious links or with a phishing site uh, so that they can gain further you know, compromise to external parties uh, within that mailbox recipient list. Um, many people I, I are under the, the understanding that email is everything. <laughs> they use it for all forms of communication. Um, a lot of our clients use email for kind of a catch-all to take notes, to overlap business and personal, um, to store data, to archive data. Um, we time and time again do our best to explain that it is not a secure form of communication. Um, it is probably one of the most insecure forms. Um, as you can see here, BECs are the initial point of entry in, in over 50% of our claims. So that is very, very high. Uh, in order to pre prevent spoofing of an email domain, uh, there are three different um, protocols that we recommend you follow. Uh, getting a little bit technical now, but like Catherine said, if we want to, if you guys want to schedule a Calendly call to discuss any of these in depth, um, anybody on our CERT team is readily available to chat with you. Um, but at a high level, these are SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. Um, and then I would say the single-handedly most important takeaway from today is to use multi-factor authentication um, on your email account. So getting into MFA, um, some people call this 2FA, MFA. Uh, this requires the users to have a second form of authentication. So either some sort of token or access via an application or a text message. Uh, if you are deciding between the two, we do recommend that you go with application permission or digital tokens rather than a text message. It has proven to be more secure, but either is better than none. Um, we advise implementing this on all business critical systems. So email being very, very important, um, any internal service or third-party service, really any software that you utilize that supports it. Um, I would say the second place, which we will get into during these slides, is any way you are accessing your network remotely. So any remote access should have MFA on them. Um, and you'll see I don't need to talk through the vendor recommendations, but on the right side, on all these slides, you'll see what we recommend in terms of specific tooling. Okay, maintain good backups. Um, this is extremely important for the ransomware matters that we deal with. So you definitely do not want to find yourself in a situation where your data is encrypted and then you go to restore from your backups and your backups are either deleted and or encrypted. Um, it's funny how all of you know security really does come full circle. Uh, when I first started doing this about 10 years ago, we'd advise the client to put everything securely, but in the cloud and on the network. Um, the people that were doing tape backups off the network were seen as legacy or kind of old school. Uh, that is still proven to this day to be the most secure method, of course, because it is completely offline. Um, backups will help in, ensure you that you can restore after an attack, so we do not have to discuss moving forward with any sort of attacker communication uh, if you are able to get your business back up and running from your backup data. So there are three ways here that we offer to maintain these backups. So regularly backing up all of the business critical data, uh, make sure you're maintaining these backups on as well as offsite so that if the attacker is on the network, they can't just navigate to them and delete them, corrupt them or encrypt them. Um, and then the third one is key. A lot of people have the 
um, understanding that they just set up backups, walk away, and there's nothing they need to do. Uh, and then they go to test their backups and they find they, they weren't backing up um, as frequently as they liked, or there's some sort of corruption or permission. Um, so making sure that you're testing your backups. So if you can try full recovery, whether that's every other month, we have clients that now test backups every two weeks, um, whatever that is for you, uh, but definitely testing to ensure that they are working correctly. Yeah, and we got one question on this, which is, what does a recovery in a ransomware event look like with good backups versus with a rebuild of the network? Sure. So that's a little bit of a loaded question because there's so many factors dependent. Um, if a client has full backups that were not impacted by the ransom event, we'll perform a forensic investigation on those backups to make sure there was no malware put onto the systems prior to the ransomware and that the backups are in fact okay to restore from. Um, we're going, we're probably gonna get into some of the legal terms, which we always defer to counsel on, but if you store any sort of sensitive information and if the malicious actor has threatened to release data or if they've proven that they've exfiltrated data, uh, we need to perform an investigation to be able to tell you know, exactly what happened on the network and what data was touched and what, you know, what was taken. Um, if you have backups though, it's much a much simpler conversation because a lot of people who do not have backups are dead in the water for lack of a better term. Um, so their business is completely crippled if they can't get any of their data back. So backups give us a good starting point to at least get the business up and running while we flesh out what happened by the bad actor um, and go down that road of, do we need to contact them for any reason? And Jen, I can add something here as well that, that Leanne was touching upon in that the forensics may look similar, right? Where they still have to look to see where the bad actor was, how they navigated the system. Was there any viewer exfiltration? But to Leanne's point, it really comes down to how long the business is down. With those backups, right, if you're able to, you know, spin to another server, uh, pull things, move from clean backups, uh, able to maybe rebuild a little bit quicker while forensics is ongoing, versus, as Leanne said, being dead in the water where you can't do anything because you have no backups to build from. And so your, the likelihood that your business interruption is longer, that's likely to occur without backups. So it's the overall kind of cost as well. Exactly. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, so briefly talked about remote, remote access. Um, this is something that we see daily um, during our scanning of, of the outside uh, infrastructure. We see about 71 million scans daily. That is to search for open RDP ports. So <clears throat> basically that means that there are 71 million scans performed by third parties, whether they're malicious actors or ethical hackers, <clears throat> excuse me, um, searching for these open ports because it's very simple for you to get into your network via RDP. And it's also very simple for a malicious actor. So they're constantly, constantly just scanning the internet, looking for these ports to try to get in your network. So remote access is a big one. Um, biggest way to lock that down is via MFA. So turning on that multi-factor authentication. We also recommend moving away from RDP since that is the default uh, remote desktop protocol that comes within a side A Windows environment. So the default port being 3389, we advise to block it on the firewall, completely shut it down um, and utilize a third party tool. Um, we have a few set up on the, on the right here under recommendations, but whether that is implementing a VPN with multi-factor, if you wanna keep RDP or you know, a few of the other tools that support that or moving away entirely to a third party tool such as TeamViewer, Screen Connector, LogMeIn with that multi-factor authentication. Um, enabled. Uh, obviously, since the pandemic started, we've seen a large number of our clients move to a total remote. A lot of them just, you know, turned on RDP because it was simple and it was free. Um, and the scanning and the attacks picked up tenfold. So it was very clear that the attackers are kind of sitting on the internet waiting for this. Yeah. 
Number five, so update your software. Um, this one is pretty straightforward, always making sure that you have the newest um, software and operating systems that you are able. Uh, Microsoft rele releases patches every Tuesday. Uh, at my old firm, we used to do something called Patch Tuesday. We were like a MSP and we would patch all of our clients every week um, around midnight on Tuesday. So we test all the patches as soon as they came out. And then later that evening, we'd apply them. Uh, so just make sure you have some sort of update whether it's a program or a process that you follow, um, making sure that your software is uh, up to date and you can remediate any of the vulnerabilities that um, the software has alerted on. So often they'll email you telling you, you know, there's been a vulnerability, please update to this version. Uh, we really advise not to wait when you receive any emails like that. One thing just to highlight on this slide as well, you know, kind of our, our vendor recommendations on the right hand side, um, all policyholders get access to coalition, coalition security product, which we call our attack surface monitor. And one of the benefits of this is it will identify and alert you when one of the uh, one of the softwares that you use that's exposed to the internet requires a patch or an update. And so this is something that uh, is a great way to sort of keep on top of some of those alerts that are uh, external facing. And then obviously, as Leanne mentioned, updating all software that's internal as well is, is also critical. Exactly. So these vulnerabilities, you know, just in summary here, they could lead to some critical takedown of, of infrastructure or ransomware deployment. Um, just like with our remote access slides, uh, if we know that the vulnerabilities are in the software, so does the attacker. So they're constantly looking for ways in, um, and this is a big one, but a very simple one, as long as you stay on top of it. Okay, password manager. So we get this one often. Um, a lot of our clients say, well, how can we make our password stronger and possibly remember all of them? Um, definitely, the first thing here is recommend implementing some sort of policy where your clients or your employees rather are not utilizing any business emails for personal use. Um, we are constantly seeing third party breaches where the username and or password was utilized in the breach and then the attacker then tries it on www.office.com or gmail.com and they just try to get in with the username. Um, I'm sure it takes a quick LinkedIn to search to find in the business associated with the user. So really keeping business and personal um, separate. And then along with that, a password manager really does help to organize the various passwords. Um, we do advise mo moving to pass phrases so short phrases. Uh, there has been a few studies where length has always beat out complexity. So making a long password passphrase is, is much simpler than, you know, a six, seven alphanumeric password with a one or two symbols in it. So make, making sure your passwords are not utilized between different pieces of software, different logins, any personal use, making sure they're unique, strong, um, updated regularly. NIST used to advise every 60 to 90 days. They've since moved away from that. If you have strong passphrases, it doesn't, it's not as um, important, but a password manager really allows you to make those difficult passwords without utilizing any of your personal information, such as last name or birthday or year you were born. So as a company, we use OnePass. Um, for my personal, I use LastPass. Uh, they're all very, very simple to set up. One other thing just to highlight on the password manager, this is something we talk about in the guide, but just want to make explicit here as well. You know, oftentimes you'll hear about these massive third party breaches that happen where another company will experience a data breach, all of the passwords for all of their customers or users will get exposed to the internet. And so one thing that we will see happen is even if you use a password manager, even if you have the most secure passwords in place, if your password is lost by a third party, it's still exposed to the internet. And this is why we so strongly recommend multi-factor authentication. As Leanne said before, it's kind of the most critical item across this whole list. Because if your password is lost by a third party, it can still be used to log in 
across other systems. And so having MFA in place is really that next level of protection to ensure that someone can't use your password without your permission. Okay, so scanning for malicious software. Um, so there are two different kind of separate scanning tools that we will uh, discuss right now. The first one being antivirus. So a lot of this is, um, you know, typical AV that you put on systems. It does a decent job of catching malware, but it's not always behavioral based. So if somebody is in the network, um, you know, scanning for searching for suspicious um, words across uh, an explorer window or harvesting credentials or um, scanning through folders and files to see how many systems on. AV doesn't do a good job of picking up that since it is behavior based. So with an EDR tool, um, which stands for endpoint detection and response, this gives you the ability to see into the behavior of your network. So to set up policies and watch lists um, and enforce these things so that if there is suspicious behavior, you don't have to wait for the actual ransom payload or any sort of malware or banking trojan to enter the network before you're alerted. Um, so we partner with Carbon Black and we uh, deploy that on all of our coalition incident response engagements. Um, Komodo, Endgame, Sentinel-1, I mean, there's a million out there. They all work similar. Um, we do advise that you hire somebody to manage it. So to review the alerts, whether that's your internal person just getting email alerts, or you have a team that looks at them weekly, or you outsource it. Um, an EDR is a really good tool to have in the network. Um, if you are having antivirus, uh, we work with malware bytes, and we also recommend pretty often Windows Defender. Those have been the best two for noticing activities such as a banking trojan, which is a type of malware that is a precursor to a ransomware infection. Um, so, I, I mean, going through these points, they're relatively straightforward, but every device that you use, whether it's your personal phone that has email, a work phone, laptop, desktop, tablet, any of this can create an open door for hackers. So having these um, AV and EDR tools in place really helps stop that. Um, and then the rise in number of endpoints attached to the network has led to an increased need for endpoint protection. Um, so always looking on the outside, looking in. Um, EDR does a really, really good job. So I guess in short, if you're going with AV, we recommend malware bytes or Windows Defender, making sure that these are on all of the uh, systems that touch the network. Um, often in ransomware cases, the first thing we see the attackers do is run a batch script, which is basically like an automated script to disable any sort of antivirus. So we want to make sure that you have alerting set up within your AV that if it is disabled, somebody is alerted and those alerts are being monitored. And we had a question about AV on mobile devices and curious what you would recommend for that specifically. Um, so antivirus doesn't do a great job on mobile. I know there are a few products out there and that's definitely, you know, not where we focus. I would say that the, the majority of the concern for any sort of tablet or phone is going to be email. So it's clicking on those malicious attachments and malicious uh, links. Um, mobile also doesn't do the best job of, kind of quarantining those. So prevention is key here. Um, so going back to kind of that slide, putting some sort of message, message hygiene in place on your message server. That way, you know, you don't even receive it or it, it hits the spam box before you can and open it. Um, and I guess we will get to this. I think it's in one or two more slides from now, but user training is a big one there, making sure you're not opening text messages or emails that you are not um, expecting. So, you know, if you don't handle invoices and you received an invoice attachment from somebody you don't recognize, don't open it. Just forward it along to your IT team or shift delete it and just get it out of the network. Another question specifically about Windows Defender, and I know this is something that a lot of our policyholders use, is this a software that's automatically installed with and part of any Windows system, or is this something that people have to separately install and manage? Sure, great question. So Windows Defender 
Um, I don't recall which iteration or versioning of Windows it came out with by default. Um, so back on like XP Windows 7, I believe you had to purchase uh, with the newer versions of the Windows operating system. It does come by default, but you do have to kind of go in there and make the customization. So making sure that you're setting up alerting and um, putting in email addresses to receive the alerts. So um, in short, it does come with the newer versions. You just got to go in and, and configure it appropriately. And then one last question specific to, um, to Windows and Office software. What's our recommendation or stance about Office 365 advanced threat protection? Is this something that we consider enough for our insurance to monitor their exposure or should they be using a different software, a different third-party application to monitor? So AT, ATP is fantastic. So highly recommend it. The problem there is that there's so many customizations and configurations that people believe just purchasing it is enough. Um, you do have to get in there and kind of tailor the policies that you'd like to enforce and set up the proper alerting and really hire somebody that knows how to get in and out with all of the Microsoft features that it offers. Um, but the product in and of itself, if you are utilizing that for like email hygiene, that is definitely um, enough. You just have to understand exactly what you're configuring within there. Okay, um, and before I move to this, I also saw something pop up asking if Mac, Macs are still considered safer than Windows. Um, they are, they absolutely are. Um, I would say 92% of the ransomware and the malware that we are dealing with uh, in these opportunistic cases are created for a Windows environment. So Linux and MacBooks excluded. Um, not to say that there is not malware that target them, but because that is still not the norm the majority of the malware is not going after those systems. Um, that might not be the response, you know, in a few years as people move away towards totally, completely Windows environments. Um, but for now, that is the case. We are not seeing it as common at, at all. Um, okay, encrypt your data. So there's two types of encryption, obviously encryption that is being <laughs> done by a ransomware bad actor, which is the bad type of encryption. Um, and then the file level or system level encryption that we advise that you put on your systems prior to any sort of incident. Um, if you have a laptop, for example, and it is lost on, a on the subway or on a bus um, and it is unencrypted, it becomes a much more significant matter. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of legality surrounding that depending on who owns it, what data is on it rather than you know, it being encrypted and then you're just using, losing a single piece of hardware. Um, so replacing a laptop at the end of the day is going to be much more cost-effective as well as much less of a headache rather than uh, losing something where there is any sort of data on it that you do not want to get out to the public uh, if there is no encryption in place. So. A few things, just passcodes are really great to have on any tablets or mobile phones. Um, BitLocker is really simple to set up on uh, any Windows device. Um, there's a few others, uh, very, very simple. Sometimes it takes a little while depending on how large the drive drives are, um, but definitely recommend encrypting all of the data that you can just in case of any theft or physical damage. Okay, and implementing a security training program. So 60% of the claims we've witnessed have been the result of human error. Um, this is a big one. So the last point here, cyber criminals rely on the manipulation of busy employees to gain access to networks. Uh, often we see malicious actors, we, we've seen them go so far as to reply in an email chain and say, oh, I understand it's not your policy to pay a wire transfer via email. Please give me a call at the number in my signature to confirm. And they've changed a single digit in their signature block of the phone number so that you can actually call them. And unless you've dealt with this person prior, you might not recognize their voice. They have people that they've hired to reply to these calls and 
advise you that all is well and that the bank account, you know, was information due to COVID or whatever was in place. Um, pretty advanced. I mean, a lot of people don't think that, especially how busy we are nowadays. Um, we really recommend having some sort of policy in place for anybody who handles any sort of financial transaction, uh, whether that is following up with a known good phone call or not accepting wires, maybe, you know, going the check route or whatever it is, just adding those policies in place to abide by in every single matter. Um, the training programs that we offer through curricula, as well as the three below are fantastic. Um, they show people the kind of phishing emails that are going around. Um, I know in the beginning of, of all of this, one of our clients who was impacted by a business email compromise received a COVID newsletter. So it was an attachment meant to give you information about the virus, but it was in fact a banking Trojan. So as soon as you open the attachment, it asks you to enable macros in the top. Um, and then you as the end user, you don't really notice anything, but the, the document is blank or it didn't fully load. So you X out of it and go along your day. Um, and what that macro actually does is it installs a banking Trojan, which is more or less a backdoor into your network, um, extremely powerful and made to evade any sort of detection. Um, and then a few weeks later, they drop a ransomware payload through that Trojan. Um, so that's it kind of at a 300 foot view high level, but training your users on what to look for and what to not to click and what to report is extremely, extremely important. Okay, excellent. Catherine, back over to you. Thank you, Leanne. Um, and as you can see, right, we have the ability to make these recommendations um, from within our team, our CERT team. Um, but as I spoke about in the beginning of all of this, that even with the best security in place, security failures can happen. Um, and they do happen. Uh, you've seen in the news, some of the largest entities <laughs> in the world uh, as well as some of the largest forensics firms in the world having security events. So these things can happen. And that's why as much as Coalition is this technology company, this security company, we are also an insurance company. And that's why you came to us. So the insurance that we provide will help you build back up for when a security failure and if a security failure occurs. But what we want to ensure is that one, you know, you, you look at these security um, processes, you look to see how you can implement them within your company, or if you're a broker, how you can help your client impl implement them as well. But remember that people like Leanne are here. They're part of our, you know, our, our CERT team. You can reach out to them. You can speak to them. We also have that in the beginning, I talked about our scanning and our alerting. Well, that's our free ongoing security and monitoring, right? Alerts will come to you. Please make sure that those alerts are going to the right person. And please speak to them and say, hey, look, when these alerts come in, know that these are key alerts. We are not going to spam you about every small little thing. What we're notifying you of is these big events, these big security things that you as a company should look at because they are opening, as Leanne talked about, that door or window to your house. So pay attention to those and make sure they're going to the right person. And then on top of it, be aware, we also have additional benefits. We have you know, free unlimited access. We have exclusive discounts. And this is for security awareness training, ransom prevention software. Please use us also as a tool to be able to get you in touch with other types of services you need. Uh, I'm gonna pause there and see if there are any further questions. If not, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen. Yeah, lots of questions. Uh, so we'll try to go through these across, across Catherine and Leanne. Um, so first, one question came up about virtual machines on the cloud and whether, you know, if an organization has virtual machines and they don't encrypt the disks on their machines, what is the risk to them? Leanne would love if you could respond to that one. Yeah, absolutely. So 
depending on which data you mean, we always uh, recommend encrypting storage data. So if, store, if you have storage data in the cloud just sitting up there, we recommend encrypting it. Um, this is where opportunistic first targeted comes in. Uh, if they are scanning VMs or they're within your network even, and there is data that is encrypted, so the full VM is encrypted, they may skip over. Um, if it is a targeted attack, I mean, there's not too much you could do in that scenario. We generally advise encryption for physical, um, just in case it is lost or damaged or, you know, somebody were to get access into your physical office and steal it. Um, it's just the biggest cost benefit to most commonly when a laptop is lost, having it encrypted and just being able to tell a legal counsel it was encrypted and we can kind of walk away onto the next thing. Um, if you are able to encrypt your VMs, absolutely. Um, but I would say in terms of cost benefit and timing, physical is much more important. Great, thank you. Um, another technical question that came in about how to evaluate attachments and, and specifically, you know, what does it mean if a client lacks the capability to automatically detonate and evaluate attachments in their sandbox environment uh, to determine if, if they may be malicious, such as you know, containing a banking Trojan? Sure, absolutely. So uh, first thing we definitely recommend against that um, definitely do not try to do any poking around yourself. We have seen time and time again where an IT team has opened something that they did not believe was malicious or, you know, they did their own research and it ends up sparking an infection. Um, you can use something as simple as virus total. So you go to www.virustotal.com. Um, you can upload a file or a full email or a website if you have any questions. It does a pretty good job of telling you kind of firsthand high level what, what you're dealing with. So it'll tell you if it's bad um, by, via a bunch of red items um, or if it's okay via green. Um, if you don't have any technical background, I would advise to not do anything um, and call us. So as part of CIR, which is the team that I help run, we have incident response services where we spin up a full investigation if you know there is an incident or a compromise. Um, in addition to that, we also offer what we call instant response um, for this exact case. So we have insureds constantly just sending us messages or having us look at logs or forwarding along an email or whatever the case may be, just to put our eyes on it to let them know what they're dealing with. Um, so in any event, no matter what, how big or small, um, if something does come up, I, I would advise to contact us before you do anything else. And just to add kind of a more emphasis on that to Leanne's last point, we've been able to help countless clients avoid full-blown claims because they report something suspicious to us early. And this can be, you know, I received an email that I wasn't expecting, or this attachment looks kind of funky. And I believe the, uh, I believe we've been able to contain 45% of events that were reported to us before they result in any cost, any expense to the insured. And so would just emphasize that reporting early, reporting often, just getting in touch with our team will really help uh, prevent some of these larger, more significant claims from occurring. A uh, bunch of questions have come in about the alerts, how they're set, where they come from, what the data, uh, what the data draws from. And Leanne, can you talk a little bit about how those alerts are configured and, and where people receive them? Sure. Um, the first part of that I did not get. So what type of alerts? So these are the alerts that we're sending through our attack surface monitor. And uh, the question is, you know, where will they be receiving these alerts? Should we uh, identify something malicious? And what are we notifying people about with these alerts? Sure. So yeah, yeah, I assume we're referring to the binary edge and kind of the proactive scanning. So we are, um, and this is more of the security engineering team, but they do scans on all of our insurance networks 
uh, twice a month. So the alerts default to the whoever signed up for the policy. Um, often we have policyholders reach out and add, you know, want us to add their the alerting to their technical team. Um, I believe, Jen, that is done via help at coalitioninc.com um, if you want to add anybody to those alerts. So twice a month we will scan you um, and provide any follow-up if there's any notification or any, anything concerning that you need to know to take proactive steps on. Um, in addition to that, if there's any high level vulnerabilities, um, I, I assume a good chunk of you have heard about the solar winds. Um, what we did is we proactively scanned all of our insureds to see who was potentially um, not compromised, but could have had the malicious DLL. And then we reached out to them individually. Um, so you can set up the alerting via the ASM portal. Uh, which I believe you can do through the policyholder dashboard, um, or at any time you could just email help at coalitioninc.com and they could walk you through. And one other thing to add to that, all policyholders receive these alerts automatically by default. And as Leanne mentioned, they're, they're going to go to the individual whose contact information we have um, as, as the point of contact for the policy. So if you've received an alert from us, Great. Hopefully you were able to you know, take some remediation actions there. If you haven't received an alert, it means we haven't found anything, haven't found anything malicious, uh, you know, externally on your impacting your network. And as Leanne mentioned, if you ever want to add others to receive those alerts, if you ever have questions on what it is that you're receiving, we are available to help and to sort of walk through how you can address the issue specifically. Uh, we have one last question. And I think this actually would be a great one to end on. So Catherine, this is about specific insurance claims and talking about some of the example incidents that we've seen that can result from either human error or having any one of these recommendations sort of misconfigured. And I'd love if you could share maybe an example or two of some of the recent events that have occurred amongst coalition's policyholders. Uh, absolutely. Uh so one of the key things that we have to be aware about when we're talking about uh, these cyber crimes, and again, let's be clear, they're crimes, uh, is that they, these bad actors, these threat actors have moved from, before they used to sell kind of email information, passwords they find, things like that. They've now realized that they don't want to um, sell data. They don't wanna be part of that. And they wanna do direct and quick monetization of their crime. So the two ways to do that uh, is funds transfer fraud or ransomware. Uh, and so in the realm of funds transfer fraud, uh, we had during this COVID, uh, we had a nonprofit who was essential to um, that state's infrastructure in terms of getting um, needs to um, those people living in the margins. Uh, and they, received an email from one of the places that they donate the money, they give money to make get food and other elements for children. The, they received an email back saying, hey, we've changed our, um, the way you pay us, we've moved banks. And they said, okay. They turned to someone next to them and said, do you think it, you know, is it okay to pay? Not next to them virtually. And they said, yep, yeah, that should be fine. Transfer the 1.4 million. They ended up transferring it to a threat actor. $1.4 million out the door. And this is a nonprofit. So this is obviously extraordinarily large nonprofit, all donation money. It's not like they were going to be able to recover it in another way. Um, and insurance only covers so much. So they called us and we said, okay, first, let's get that money back. Um, and we got all of it back except for $500, which our CEO then donated $500 to the nonprofit. Um, so beyond that, we, they said, they were like, okay, well then we're good. And I said, no, 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 no. What you're missing here is that underlying this is a security failure somewhere, either in your system or in the other vendor's system. So we went looking through and sure enough, they had a business email compromise because there's no way that a threat actor would know that these two entities, unless it's out in a public page, do work together and when that payment was due. So we found that underlying email intrusion and right in between there, the bad actor put themselves in and said, okay, this is where I'm gonna insert myself. 
prevent anybody else from getting the other emails and now divert the money to somewhere else. So that's how something like a, a funds transfer fraud happens. Ransomware, the other way that threat actors are immediately monetizing, this is when they go in, they encrypt your entire system so that you have a bunch of bricks around, right? All your endpoints aren't working, which are your computers, your servers are down, your warehouse isn't working, uh, your phone lines may not be working, all of those things happen. If you have those key backups that Leanne spent time talking about, we're able to rebuild quicker from there. But we've had cases where uh, we had an essential working firm. Uh, they were, again, just during COVID, so last few months. Uh, they made alcohol to drink, very important during COVID. Alcohol to use on your hands, very important during COVID. So they made these two elements uh, and they were brought down to their knees. They were not able to function. Uh, they had a, a high demand, but as Leanne talked about, they had backups. So while we were still negotiating with the threat actor to keep them on the hook, right? To see if we had to do something with them, see if we had to pay them. We were working furiously to see if those backups were significant enough and sufficient enough to be able to bring the insured back online and maybe not even have to pay the bad actor, right? So those are kind of two key examples that you as a company or you as a broker um, should be talking about and realizing that this is what those simple security measures can prevent from happening. Thank you, Catherine. And one other thing I would reference if you have uh, if you have an interest in learning more about some of the claims that we at Coalition have experienced, there's two things that we've start, that we've done recently. So the first is we published our claims report, which was our first report on sort of the claims experience and data that we have. And we can send this out in the follow-up email after this presentation, but this provides a lot of examples and in-depth analysis of some of the trends that our claims team has seen over the last year. Um, so we'd recommend looking at that for some more information. And the other thing that we've started doing is we have a blog series uh, called the Coalition Claims Chronicles where we share different examples of events that are reported to us and how various teams respond. So our incident response team that Leanne leads, our security team, our claims team. And so those provide some more in-depth examples as well of just how claims events unfold and how Coalition uh, is, is supporting our clients through the recovery process. So I just want to put a quick highlight on the cybersecurity guide uh, as we wrap up. All of the recommendations that we talked through today are part of our 2021 cybersecurity guide. And you know, we kind of talked about this throughout the presentation, but we have such a unique view into the cybersecurity measures that really matter in terms of helping prevent and contain cyber events. And we've taken all of these recommendations, everything we talked through in the presentation today and put it in this guide that you, your organization, your clients can use to ensure that you're protected uh, and that you have all of the most sort of critical measures in place. And we'll go through all of these, uh, these 10 aspects that we talked about today with specific explanations about each of these recommendations, specific vendors that we recommend, um, as well as certain partners that coalition policyholders have access to you know, discounted or free software to, uh, to protect their organization. And so we'll be sending out this guide following the presentation and encourage you to read it, review it, determine where you stack up against each of these recommendations. And of course, if you have any gaps or anything that needs to be implemented in your organization, we encourage you to contact us because we're here to help. I mentioned that we'll be sending out the guide to all attendees. So thank you for, for joining us this morning. You can also access it from coalitioninc.com slash cybersecurity dash guide. Went through a lot of questions, so I can skip this one and just thank everyone again for making time to learn more about our cybersecurity offering and the recommendations that we offer to all of our clients. Uh, there was a last question that came in about how to access support. And 
wanted to point out the two fastest ways for you to reach help. If ever you have a question, or in particular, if you expect if you're experiencing a live event that you need help with immediately. So we have our email address, help at coalitioning.com or .ca if you're in Canada. Uh, we monitor this 24 seven. And so always take questions and help through those emails. And most importantly, again, if you expect or suspect that you're experiencing a live event, we recommend that you call us. It's the fastest way to reach our team. And we have a response time of under five minutes if you don't get someone right away. Um, and you can see the phone number there at the bottom of the screen. Thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your day and a very happy holiday.